Why did California shrink so much? California is the most popular state in the US, and its third largest by land area. But it used to be over twice its size. Once, California stretched hundreds of miles to the east, covering Nevada, Utah, and parts of Arizona, Colorado, and New Mexico. So how did this massive territory go from this to this? Well, it's a story of war, slavery, and politics that reshaped the history of the entire United States. The Spanish were responsible for defining this massive area as Alta California. Spanish missionaries first settled into modern California in the 18th century, but despite its beautiful and fertile lands, it was little more than a backwater of Spain's empire. Explorers staked Spain's claim to the lands further east, but this was mostly unforgiving desert and saw very little human settlement. When Mexico achieved independence from Spain in 1821, it kept control of Alta California and recognized the potential of developing the West Coast. However, they weren't the only ones. Settlers were slowly streaming into California, first by sea, then across the Sierra Nevada mountains after 1827. Most of them were American Protestants, who weren't keen on being governed by Mexican Catholics. Then, when war broke out between Mexico and the U.S. in 1846, mostly over the issue of Texas, the U.S. was quick to take advantage of the pro-American sympathies of California's population. A small U.S. force under Captain John Fremont entered the territory by land to support the Bear Flag Revolt by pro-Americans in the territory, while a naval force under Commodore John Sloat seized the capital at Monterey with little resistance. The minimal Spanish forces left in the region surrendered to Fremont after the Battle of La Mesa in January 1847, placing the whole of Alta California under U.S. control. A temporary military government was set up until proper governing arrangements could be made in peacetime. Mexico would never be able to retake it, and when the war came to an end with the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo in February 1848, it was forced to permanently surrender all of Alta California to the United States. Little did anyone signing the treaty know that mere days earlier, settlers had struck gold at Sutter's Mill near modern-day Sacramento. The gold rush had begun. This land with some potential for settlement was transformed overnight into some of the most valuable territory on Earth. By the time word reached Washington, D.C. of the discovery of gold, thousands of settlers had begun rushing west. Tens of thousands more would come in the following years. The temporary military government could not hope to control California much longer, not with the explosion in population and the value of the land. The Californians themselves weren't happy being under military rule in the first place, and the military wasn't comfortable exercising authority over civilians either. California needed a new government, one that could manage the gold rush and forge a path to U.S. statehood. But Washington was paralyzed with indecision, mostly over slavery. No matter how valuable California's gold was, admitting a new state would mean upsetting the balance of pro- and anti-slavery states in the Union. Such a thing could provoke civil war. California's final military governor, Brigadier General Bennett Riley, realized that California would have to sort its own affairs first if they wanted to get anywhere. In mid-1849, he called for a constitutional convention to establish a proper civilian government and make arrangements to apply for statehood. That September, 48 delegates met in Monterey to hammer out the blueprint for their new state. There was broad agreement on securing voting rights for white men, extending property rights to women, and establishing the legislature. However, there were some big problems to address. Firstly, Alta California was massive, far too large for the emerging government to manage it effectively. Such a large state probably wouldn't be accepted in D.C. anyway. While some delegates wanted to retain the entire territory, the clear majority didn't think it was worth it. Most of the land east of the Sierra Nevadas was barely hospitable desert after all, and losing it wasn't much of a loss. Furthermore, the few people who were living to the east of the mountains were mostly Mormons. Christians they claimed to be, but they were a distinct group with their own culture and no representation at the convention. At the same time, the Mormons were exploring the possibility of their own state in the Eastern Territory, 
that they wanted to call Deseret. Most of the population, the fertile land, and the gold was west of the Sierra Nevadas. The mountains, therefore, offered a natural border and defensive barrier for the new state. So, the delegates drew up the border of their new state at the mountains, and relinquished California's claim to its old eastern territory. Of course, the plan had to be accepted by Congress, and to do that, California had to wrestle with the greatest issue of the day, slavery. Slavery had existed only on a limited scale in California, and the delegates were overwhelmingly in favor of declaring it a free state. The pro-slavery voices were too few to overrule them, but even the most moral anti-slaver knew that declaring themselves a free state would earn them a fierce fight in Washington. Nevertheless, the state constitution was finalized in October, and ratified by a popular vote in November. With it, two senators were selected to head to the capital and get its approval and admission into the Union. Captain Fremont's conquests earned him one of the Senate seats, while the second went to the Tennessee-born William Gwynn, a Southerner with slavery sympathies of his own. When they reached the capital, Fremont and Gwynn found the nation struggling on the brink of war. Thirty years earlier, the Compromise of 1820 had managed to force an uneasy truce on the slavery issue. The U.S. was split between 15 pro- and 15 anti-slave states. The admission of a 31st state in California would tip the balance of power against slavery and anger the South. No one was more aware of this than South Carolina Senator and former Vice President John C. Calhoun. By 1849, his health was failing. But that didn't stop him being the figurehead of the opposition to California's admission. He would accept no compromise on the issue of slavery, saying, I trust that we shall persist in our resistance until the restoration of all our rights, that being slavery, or disunion, one or the other, is the consequence. Meanwhile, President Zachary Taylor was too far in the other direction. Despite being a slaveholder, he did not see slavery as viable in the West. He wanted California and the newly acquired New Mexico admitted as free states immediately, a proposal that Senator Gwynn, despite his own pro-slavery sympathies, knew would be unacceptable to the South. Debate raged in the Senate for months. Supporters cited California's gold and access to the Pacific as too valuable to pass up. Calhoun was unimpressed and called the formation of the state government illegal and insisted that the South would be better off seceding than accepting another anti-slavery state. There needed to be compromise, and that compromise was proposed by Senators Henry Clay of Kentucky and Stephen Douglas of Illinois. Clay proposed that California be admitted as a free state, while all of that former territory would be admitted as the territory of Utah or as part of the territory of New Mexico. This would avoid adding too many anti-slavery states at once, and opened the potential of either one being admitted as a pro-slavery state in the future. Clay also offered an olive branch to both sides, outlawing slave trading in D.C. for the abolitionists and passing the Fugitive Slave Act, limiting non-slave states' ability to help runaway slaves, which pleased the slaver states. The extremes on both sides were still unhappy. Calhoun fiercely opposed it, and President Taylor wasn't pleased with it either. Hardline abolitionists considered it an unacceptable moral compromise. Fate would intervene, though. Senator Calhoun died in March, and President Taylor followed in July, to be replaced with a much more moderate Millard Fillmore, who threw his support behind the compromise. A historic, heartfelt appeal by Senator Daniel Webster of Massachusetts called for people to support Clay's compromise to save the Union and avoid a civil war over slavery. This time, it worked, and after passing votes in the Senate and House of Representatives, the so-called Compromise of 1850 was signed into law. California became the 31st state. Its former Eastern Territory was carved off into the territory of Utah and would be divided into the modern states of Utah, Nevada, Colorado, and Arizona in the following years, with a piece of New Mexico, too. Of course, history shows us that the Compromise barely bought a decade of peace for the slavery issue, but that decade was hard won. California might have lost even more land in the following years if the pro-slavery lobby had their way. 
After its admission as a state, a small but vocal number of Southerners and Hispanic Californians, including Senator Gwynn, called for the southern part of the state to secede and create their own pro-slavery state they dubbed Colorado. Their culture and society was too different to the more urbanized North, they said. This very nearly came true. The PICO Act passed the state legislature in 1859 with proposals to split the state, but the election of President Abraham Lincoln in 1860 and the outbreak of the Civil War shortly after put a permanent end to the plans. While there have been attempts to split the massive state since then, none have succeeded. Its former territories in the East are now comfortably states of their own, and it's easy to forget just how much the Sunshine State had shrunk from its earliest days. 174 years later, despite political, social, and economic transformation, California's boundaries still hold true.